title chapter 24 is industry comes of age. A big part of the Gilded Age was the rise of big business. And uh, we'll be talking about that and the, those people who were the richest people in America at the time, the owners of business, people like Rockefeller, Morgan, Carnegie, we'll go over, over them. Um, so one of the biggest of big businesses during the Gilded Age was, of course, the railroads. Uh, after the Civil War, here railroad production grew, you know, 35,000 miles of track uh, in 1865 compared to 192,000 as of 1900. So all that happened during the Gilded Age. Railroads, huge, big business. Uh, Congress was giving land to the railroad companies at a staggering rate. 155 million acres of land was given to the railroad companies by the United States government as enticement to build railroads. So if you look at this uh, map here, you see that the thicker the line, the more land that was given away. There were huge land grants given by Congress to the railroad companies. So it all started here with the uh, first transcontinental railroad that we've talked about before that went from Omaha, Nebraska to Sacramento. And you could see the amount of land here that was given away to entice these companies to build that railroad. Uh, up here, you know, later on, it's this is tougher, t tough to convince a railroad company that you need to build this railroad that goes, you know, from Minnesota all the way to Seattle, uh, because it goes through territory like Montana and, you know, North Dakota, and it's very cold up there. The growing seasons are short and they would say, well, why would anybody want a railroad up there? Well, okay, we'll give you all this land. So with that land, those railroad companies make money off of that. They could sell that land and then, then, then they would sell the land to their future customers. For example, the Union Pacific, when they sold land to people who moved into Nebraska, they sold it at a pretty high price because the land is very fertile and the people who grow whatever crop it is, mostly in Nebraska, it'd be corn, of course, and wheat and they would use those railroad companies to get their crop to market. And a lot of times those railroad companies then what's sometimes referred to as railroaded the farmer, meaning screwed those farmers out of huge amounts of money, overcharged them and made a ton of money off of them. So, hey, here's your land at a very cheap price, if not free sometimes, and then nothing comes for, is for free, right? And then those, those farmers would get railroaded by the railroad company. The Transcontinental Railroad, we've discussed that in here before. Um, there's a lot of abuses and, and uh, corruption that went around along with that. Abuse of workers, uh, like the Chinese were, were worked, some of them to death. Um, and then, you know, of course, we have the Credit Mobilier scandal, um, where there was a false company that was made um, under Grant's administration. Um, and cheating the government out of millions and millions of dollars, but that was big business at that time. So the first, the, that first transcontinental railroad came together at uh, uh, Utah in prom it's a place called Promontory Point, Utah, where they had a ceremony where the two, the Union Pacific who was laying track going west, westward and the Central Pacific going eastward where they came together and they completed the railroad. Again, it was 1869. And you know, a lot a, a lot of celebration, but also there's a lot of corruption that went went along with it. The Union Pacific laid 1,086 miles of track, and then the Central Pacific 689 miles of track. But remember, the Central Pacific it was slow going because you had to go over the Sierras and the Rocky Mountains. Whereas if you're Union Pacific, you were laying track at a very quick rate because it's so flat out there. And as we know, that's why they created that false company called Credit Mobilier, and they doubled the amount of money that they were making. Speaking of the ceremony, there it is right there. It's when the t they brought the rails together, big celebration. So with all this, you know, with the railroads, uh, the miles, track miles increasing dramatically after the Civil War, it brought on some big time improvements in railroads like steel rails instead of iron. Iron wasn't as strong as steel, so it's safer uh, to, to uh, use steel rails. The Westinghouse air brakes that made travel safer also, so trains could stop e easily and not go off the tracks. Uh, Pullman palace cars for uh, comfort. So now that you can 
you know, hop on a train and go all the way across the United States, you're sleeping and you wanted to make sure that you had sleeping cars and palace cars and dining cars. So big time improvements there. Uh, standard time uh, for convenience and for safety purposes, they, they wanted to standardize everything. Um, and we came up with the time zones. And sometimes it, back then it was called railroad time because you needed to know what time you had to catch your train. Also, you needed to know when trains needed to go off the track if another train was coming. It's not like you had, you know, westbound and eastbound, two, two lanes like you do on a, a highway or something. No, that didn't happen. Um, it was one way. And then if a train was coming the other way, you needed to get off on a, get, a, get out off the tracks uh, at a turnout somewhere and wait for the other train to go by. So they had to know exactly what time that train was coming. And it wasn't good enough to just say, uh, it's around one or around 12 and no one really knew what time that was. So they came up with the idea of standard time. Uh, and then standard gauge is the distance between the rails, four feet, eight and a half inches is what, what they, the distance they came up. Instead of having different railroad companies lay uh, the tracks and have different distances between the rails, they said it, they standardized it. They called it standard gauge. And uh, that way it's more efficient. So you didn't have to raise uh, rail, uh, cars and put new wh uh, wheels on so that they would match the next track. It just it was so much better that way. So there's a example of a palace car. The time zones that we have, the four time zones that we have in the United States. Of course, we're in the Pacific. You have mountain, you have central, and you have the eastern time zones. There's another map of that. Okay, uh, corruption in the railroads. Lots of corruption. All of these terms right here uh, are examples of different types of corruption. Basically, it is at, at the very heart of almost every one of these terms, whether it be a bribe, maybe not a bribe, but a monopoly, a pool, a trust, horizontal integration, interlocking directories. It's all, all those that I just mentioned are ways that companies used to eliminate competition to maximize profit. Their goal would be to eliminate any kind of competition so that they can maximize those profits and make as much money as they possibly can. Um, that would be the, their goal, of course. So monopoly would be, you know, uh, control of a market and a pool would be, um, a pool might be where companies uh, all have a meeting and decide we're all going to charge a high price and then we're going to share in the profits. And, and trusts are very similar to that. Uh, horizontal integration is buying up other companies so that you could um, be the only one, uh, you know, buying, buying people out. For example, a guy who did use that um, very effectively was Rockefeller, and we'll talk about his use of horizontal integration, um, where you force some people out of business. You, you say, I, I'm going to lower my, my price so low, and then no one's going to go to your business, and you're going to go out of business, and then I'm still going to be um, making a profit. Farmers attempted to unite a number of different times. Um, we've discussed uh, how they, you know, in the last chapter, we talked about the, they finally were able to have a, a you know, a, a political party in the populist party, but patrons of husbandry were known as Grange meetings. There were grand, there were farmers in an area, like say, for example, we talk about farmers in Salinas would go to a Grange meeting and they'd talk about um, the problems that they have and, you know, how they could fix those problems. Uh, and it was just more a social thing. Uh, there were picnics and dances and, you know, holidays that they would have and everybody would get together and talk about how um, times are tough and what they could do. Um, and they would oftentimes call for uh, the, the state to control business, big business. In the Wabash case, it was a setback for farmers. Uh, when the Supreme Court ruled that states could not regulate interstate commerce, it was the federal government only that could regulate interstate commerce. And of course, you know, farmers were feeling like the federal government was in cahoots with uh, big business. 
uh, for many of the reasons that we talked about last chapter, like, you know, JP Morgan giving $65 million in gold to the, to the United States government to shore up the treasury. You know, there's a definitely a relationship between business and the government, and that's not good for the common man. So when the farmer started saying state of Indiana needs to control interstate commerce, um, these railroad companies are charging outrageous prices. And, the, and in the Wabash case, they ruled, nope, states cannot do that. It's the federal government. So it was a setback for farmers. However, in 1887, the Interstate Commerce Act was passed, which was a benefit, looked like on the outside, a benefit to farmers. It banned any kind of rebates, pools, um, trusts, anything like that, and made it, made it so that, uh, well, attempted to make it so that companies, railroad companies couldn't overcharge farmers. They were charging them outrageous prices. They would raise the prices really high. And then when farmers were just about to go out of business, they would then lower the, pr the price so that, you know, they wouldn't have to, uh, they wouldn't make them go out of business. Because if a farmer went out of business, well, then obviously they're not going to provide any type of business to uh, the government. So it was just uh, the Interstate Commerce Act passed in, in 1887 uh, was supposed to help farmers, but it really, um, they was ignored because the, the, the government wasn't powerful enough or didn't want to enforce it. So they didn't enforce it. Uh, but here's the deal with it. We call it a red letter law, meaning that it was the first time that a law was passed to help farmers in this area. So down the road, it will, you could look back and say, hey, in 1887 with the Interstate Commerce Act, that was some progress made by farmers. The Wabash case was a setback. Well, Interstate Commerce was, Act was a, was a benefit and really down the road, it's gonna help them. Granges. The United States is gonna become the, uh, number one manufacturer in the world. Um, and that, that it's going to happen rather quickly uh, with the, the reasons being is all these, the lists that I have right here, the reasons why the U.S. became number one manufacturer in the world after they were about 100 years behind. I mean, France and England all had the Industrial Revolution going on there for 100 years before it came to America. But we had liquid capital, meaning we had money. We had fully exploited natural resources like coal, iron, and oil. We had a massive immigration, people coming to this country that could be a, a cheap form of labor. And then we had some pretty smart people. Examples would be Thomas Edison, who invented you know, a lot of things. He had an invention factory, as a matter of fact, because he invented so many things where he would just work on inventions all day long. And then uh, Alexander Graham Bell inventing the telephone in 1876. So yeah, there's there, believe it or not, that's the first ever telephone. Not sure exactly how it worked. We, the, when we talk about having money and, and lots of it, you had people like Andrew Carnegie, one of the most interesting uh, titans of industry in the history of the United States. Here's a guy who immigrated from Scotland in 1835 with no money at all. And he just worked jobs and tried to make as much money as he could and just saved it and saved it and saved it. He was um, the, a master at vertical integration. As a, Vertical integration is legal compared to horizontal immigration, which is not legal. Uh, vertical in, integration involves buying up all the factors of production. Uh, for example, what Carnegie is most known at as is, is a steel, the, a, a person who has made a ton of money in the steel industry, Carnegie Steel, which eventually will become the current country. Uh, company we have in the United States today called United States Steel. He used vertical integration to build up Carnegie Steel into the largest corporation in America at the time. How did he do this? Well, he bought up, like I said, all the factors of production. So he would own the land where they mined for iron ore. He owned the railroad companies that, that uh, transported the iron ore to the uh, mills and Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh, where they would turn the iron ore into um, steel. And then he'd own the, the company that did that, and he'd own the, the distribution company as well. So he owned all factors of production and paid himself every step of the way. And that's how he used it, vertical integration to, to be one of the richest men in America at the time. 
uh, with the use of the Bessemer process. When the Bessemer process was invented, steel became affordable. It's a cheap, easy way to burn impurities out of iron ore. And once you burn the impurities out of iron ore, you get steel. Later, he, uh, Carnegie later sold Carnegie Steel to J.P. Morgan, another guy that we'll be talking about, for a cool $400 million in the 1800s. An outrageous price at that time. I can't even tell you how, what that price would be today. Carnegie also wrote, is well known as a, a writer. He wrote an article, a well-known article called The Gospel of Wealth, where he argued that it was the duty of rich men and women to use their wealth to benefit the welfare of the community. Uh, he wanted to give away all of his money after he retired. His goal was to give all his money away to charity. He had so much money that he was not successful in doing that. Um, but yeah, he, he basically he said that in Gospel of Wealth that uh, you're, you're always going to have rich and you're always going to have poor. And it's the job of the rich to take care of the poor. So here's Russell Conwell talked about wealth no longer looked at as bad. Uh, view of sign of God's approval. Uh, it was a Christian duty to accumulate wealth and then help the poor. Here is what uh, Andrew Carnegie said. Uh, he believed he was a believer that the Anglo-Saxon race was superior. So a little bit of uh, racism there, no doubt about it. Inequity is inevitable and good. Wealthy should act as trustees for their brethren. And there's a picture of Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie is a philanthropist. A philanthropist is someone who gives away their money. He set up a trust for the improvement of mankind. Um, he said he uh, donated books and buildings and built and was responsible for the building of over 3000 public libraries, the Carnegie Institute of Pittsburgh, the Carnegie Institute of Technology and the Carnegie Institute of Washington for the research into the natural and physical sciences. He also established the endowment for internal peace in an effort to prevent future wars. By the time he died in 1919, he had given away some $350 million and he had $125 million left that was placed into the Carnegie Corporation to carry on his good works where it still does that today. Just, I was just going, doing some research and the richest sports franchises today, Dallas Cowboys at 4 billion, Real Madrid at 3.7 and Barcelona at 3.4. The richest companies, this is as of 2018, I probably need to do some more research, but Walmart was number one. I don't think they are now, but uh, ExxonMobil, Berkshire Shire Hathaway, Apple there. The richest people in the United States. Again, this is 2018. Jeff Bezos, the, uh, the owner of Amazon, $160 billion. Bill Gates, $97 billion. And then I, I read this, that if Bill Gates were to drop a $100 bill on the ground, he would make the money back before he picked it up off the ground. So all the interest that he has from his $97 billion, $100, before he could pick up a $100 bill on the ground, he would have already made more than that. Warren Buffett, who uh, owns Berkshire Hathaway, $88 billion. And Zuckerman, obviously Facebook, Zuckerberg, sorry, uh, $61 billion. And then Larry Ellison, $58 billion. This is, these are the 15 richest men in American history. So they took, you know, how much they made over time. They put it in today's dollars and they figured that John D. Rockefeller was the richest man ever in the history of the United States. And you could see people that we've been talking about like Andrew Carnegie um, is on there, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, JP Morgan. All right. That's the end of part one, chapter 23.